Hey guys, how's it going? This episode is a little bit different than previous ones in that it's with someone who's not particularly involved in the off-grid world or even community world. She is involved in the connecting people world though. Liz Williams is Guy Williams' sister and I'm very pleased that he introduced me because her experience of creating conversations and breaking barriers and improving communication between groups and individuals was fascinating to me and key for the exploration of how communities can work better. So I think this conversation was certainly one in which I learned a lot. Uh, let me know as always. Yeah, let me know if, if things are interesting, if there's more you want to hear about certain subjects. And of course, if you or anyone you know has something to offer and could uh, provide a good conversation, then get in touch about that as well. It's a real pleasure to hear people and get feedback and know that people are listening. It's exciting. Last but not least, I'm keeping this independent, advertising free and putting my own money into it, my own time. And if there's any help you can offer i would be more than happy to receive it so there's patreon page there's donation pages only if it feels good and feels comfortable and you feel like you can spare the change um, but when it does come it's something that means a lot to me and helps keep things going and helps keep uh, new guests coming uh, there's also t-shirts for sale I sold a few now which is cool on um, uh, off grid vision if you go to the shop the link at the top there there's a whole bunch of bamboo shirts and long sleeve t-shirts even a hoodie or two uh, for men women and children so check those out and now i bring you liz thanks for talking it's um it's been a while to get the call organized but it's cool to finally meet up yeah, good to connect. Good yeah. to hear your voice. It's funny, I thought that when Guy wrote An Older Sister, I thought he was talking about some sort of a lady who was like a sister to him. And then it was like only recently, no, I was I'm like, original. no, it is actually his sister. <laughs> An actual one. <laughs> From the same mister. Yeah, that's, a, that's hilarious. Um, <laughs> Nepotism all the way. Yeah. But you're, you're in London, yeah? Yeah, so I'm living in, and working in, in London, UK. Okay. Been a while then, or, or not? What, living and working here? So, yeah. moved here in 2015, and it's actually a bit of a laugh, really, because the one place I was never going to live in my life... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't even just not on the life plan, it was the anti-life plan. Yeah, that's probably the problem, actually. It often happens, doesn't it? When you, when you sort of say, must not fall, that's what happens, or when you say, must not, whatever, it's like, it, somehow it, it happens anyway. Here I am in a giant city living in amongst, you know, Western society, if that's what we're going to call it, all the things that were just never, ever going to happen. But it's all right. Wow. It's all, uh, it's all a learning and, and growth experience. So cool. they just take it as it comes. Well, listen, let me just give you a sort of brief, rough plan, but I'm all up for anything that you sort of any branches or or sort of side tracks or whatever that happens is, is cool. And as I said on the email, we can always take stuff out, um, but we can't mm -hmm. put stuff back in. Yeah. So I was going to just sort of um, introduce this as a bit of a different um, conversation than normal because it's probably more on the um, connected side of things rather than the off-grid off side of things, mm -hmm. um, which is great because as Guy mentioned, I've had quite a few conversations about off-grid stuff and, and I'm ready for a change as well. So this is really exciting to me. But introduce that and then maybe just warm up with a little bit about what you do and how come you do it and that kind of stuff. And then move into some different things that I've been thinking about recently. And we'd just love to hear your take on, you know, and if you have anything you want to say, then just go ahead and, and say it anytime, whatever. It teaches me so much to get to speak to people and organize my thoughts about different stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, my I, I figured the only thing I can do really is satisfy my curiosity about things okay. that I'm interested in. Okay. And hopefully right. that means at least one person, i.e. me, is interested in it. And, <laughs> and, 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 and I know, you know, more about my audience than most, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But, but that way, hopefully people will find that kind of stuff interesting. Okay. And I'm trying to 
move towards a different way of life in a practical mm -hmm. sense, but I'm still interested in a sort of semi-academic way about thinking about that as well and thinking, mm -hmm. what, you know, I don't just want to sort of have some chickens and survive. I want to sort of look out and see what kind of actions can best help other people. We're all so different that some people are going to do things one way and that's going to help things and other people's going to do another thing and that's going to help. And from the scientist to the care worker to the off-grid builder to the think tanker to et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. Mm. It seems to me that kind of the, the thing that this all hangs on is just saying we think there can be a different way to be in this world and we are going to, no one's giving it to us, we're going to figure it out yeah. through action, really. Yeah. Whether that action is, is, is individual within within a, a little sphere and some changes you, you, you make to your particular life or whether it's some people are drawn to getting involved in much bigger systemic things um but it, it, it seems to me and maybe i'm being quite influenced of course th through an inter through many interactions with my brother um, <laughs> and the thing that binds us together which is really i guess the link that has led you and me together is is that link through guy something some kind of link that he th sees there and i guess my story is i i might not be off grid but I'm also part of some kind of narrative of saying there must be another way. Totally. And I don't know what it is and stumbling and falling down and picking up and carrying on, but just kind of figuring it out as, as I go, really. Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what it is. And and I always find myself a little bit on, not on the fence, but between two worlds. When I'm around the suits, I feel like I'm a bit of a hippie. When I'm around the hippie, I feel like a suit and, and, and <laughs> you know, but I'm trying to sort of, well, I have accepted that and, and I'm mm. beginning to realize that it's a, a quite nice place to be in terms of seeing different <laughs> angles and hopefully sometimes merging things towards something more productive. But it's just a beginning. So yeah. let's just see where this goes. The conversation is going to steer towards mainstream solutions, what we've just been talking about in terms of making mm -hmm. things better and maybe decentralized solutions and then the sort of the isolationist like the off-grid stuff mm -hmm, is probably mm -hmm. not either of our cup of tea even though uh, I'm probably you know I'm fascinated by the idea of off-grid and, and independence and stuff and the freedom that gives but yeah it's a question of what's the best place to put our energy what each one of us has in terms of individual skills so I was hoping to just speak to you about a what you do and what your skills are so you know, yeah. When people say, uh, what do you do, and you're at a party and you think they might be interesting, you mm -hmm. want to give them the medium-long answer rather than the, the mm -hmm. short answer, what, what do you say? Yeah, depends how naughty I'm feeling. <laughs> so when, I just, when it just comes out, I just say to people, I help, I help groups of people have human conversations with each other. Wow, okay. Is, is the really short, direct, from my heart answer. If people are finding that that's great and mysterious and a bit provoking, but doesn't really help them put anything tangible to it, what I then say is I help individuals, teams or groups, um, and sometimes at an organizational and more and more often at a multi-stakeholder level, so various actors in a system, um, come together and in my ideal world, go through collective experiences to see their, share, their shared challenges with fresh eyes and a bit differently. Wow. Ideally, reach some fresh insights and then be able to move from the idea bit to the action bit. So what am I actually going to do differently? And quite often when people hear that, they think, oh, well, that's just that's just change and that's just team development. Oh yeah, I know what that is. And they immediately want to slap something onto it. But there's a second part to it, which is trying to get people to access parts of their thinking and realizing and insight that typically day to day in the world that many of us live in are not given the time or space, the thinking space, the quality holding space to do. So what, can you give me an example? Can you give me an example of something that someone might not be aware of? Yeah, so, and some of it might be from 
from my world, I work for a big engineering firm, and so I'm, I'm often with, with teams of, of very clever, geeky people um, working in engineering and construction. But so, for example, I had a uh, project manager come to me, had a team of people who were doing some engineering design work for a client, and they were really struggling to form a good relationship with that client, and it really wasn't working well. And he came to me and said, well, I, you know, you're one of these people, people, mm -hmm. and you know about how people must build relationships. So I need you to come and tell my people, teach them how to do relationship stuff. You know, there must be a formula. It's been well studied. You just come and you tell them and then they go and they do it. And I kind of caught myself in that moment of going, yeah, I can, I can put together a skill session on, on relationship building. I know exactly what it would look like. It would have an introduction. It would have adult learning principles of why we are here today and the outcomes you will expect by the time you have finished this course. Okay. You know, I, I can do all of that and we'd do some role play and it would all be very nice. And I caught myself and said, okay, this is what we're going to do instead. <laughs> I'm going to uh, just have a short discussion with your team members around a conversation that each of them need to have with the client person that they connect with. And they're going to have just, a, I'm going to t ask them to just have a slightly different conversation to the one that they normally have. And this guy was all a bit mystified and didn't really get it, but bless him, as they would say in the UK here, he said, okay, we'll give this a go. And what I did was I asked each of those team members to go and have a conversation with their client counterpart, but their job was to listen, simply to listen and to put aside their prior judgments, cynicisms, even if they were disagreeing with what they were hearing, their job was to appreciate the conversation that they were having. And they were to put aside, typically day to day, that group of people are tasked with, when they're listening to a client, they've got a solution. They've got to show value through solutioning. So they're typically listening to answer, not to understand. So they went away and had these conversations, which they were quite nervous to have, came back. And what they said to me was, oh, we don't think we need to have that workshop anymore because our relationships have completely shifted with our clients. Oh, wow. <laughs> And I said, well, let's still have the workshop, but let's rather work with the insights, the fresh insights that you have now gained. Because what you were actually doing without realizing it was you were providing a quality thinking space in that conversation with your client, which is what you have not been doing before. Yeah. Was that something, sorry to interrupt, was that some, was the, what was the balance between genders here? Um, there was probably a 70 30 split men to women. Right. And were the client maybe more women or and the engineers men. all men or was it? Men. Right, men. right. Men. So, no, so, so wait, the client, <laughs> your, your client or your, wait, sorry, I'm, I'm asking that question in the wrong way. The, the people who were, there was one group of people who wanted, who were struggling to relate yes. to another group of people. And yes. the group that came to you were men. The group that came to me were a mixture of men and women. Okay. And then the other group were more men. Were more men. Okay. And that was their client that they were struggling to okay. connect with was, was male, mostly men. I see the same thing play out, though, with women clients as well. Um, and it, it's really interesting, actually. I've learned to sometimes almost pay more attention because I, it's everything I'm sharing with you is lens through the environment that I typically work in, yeah. which is a very an industry that is very dominated by your knowledge and your know-how and your ability to you are the source of the solution as an individual. Mm. And I find that sometimes women in this environment are having to prove their worth triply to men. Absolutely. So are getting even more drawn into feeling I must be the sole source and I must show up and I must speak up. And it, they almost have to, the, the conventional wisdom is, is that they might not, they, they would be slightly easier to connect with. 
But I find sometimes they actually have had to work so hard to build up a particular persona that there's even more to get through to really get to the human in them sometimes. I can totally imagine that. I mean, my example of this kind of inaction is, you know, Maggie Thatcher. I mean, that having to be (laughs) more man than man because (laughs) the world, the culture is is male dominated or let's say maybe I don't even want to say male we always get onto shaky ground here yeah. but you know sort of very yang if you like is a sort of yes like, yeah. yeah that energy yeah 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 we talk typically about um and this is I mean I don't think this is shaky ground this is an observed thing this is what happens in teams and in leadership if you imagine a, a wheel a hub and spoke wheel women's pattern in general is to more often want to build connections through the spokes of the wheel and connect the different terminus points of those spokes to each other. So they want to create a network and and connect people. If if the women are the center of that wheel, the hub of that wheel, and the spokes are going out and, and have terminus points, women typically want to connect those those terminus points to each other, say, oh, I know who you need to speak to in order to get this done. It, it's so-and-so. Mm. Whereas typically the more male pattern, not every male, but typically in the balance of probability, is to say, I am the hub of that, I am the hub of that wheel, and all things must channel channel through the terminus um, into me, through the terminal points into yeah. me. But we 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 run the risk of, of repeatedly, you know, valuing that as, as how leadership or value shows up um, and undervaluing the behavior related to connecting spokes, uh, those, those terminus points of the spokes to each other, uh, which I think if we think about the challenges that we face just systemically globally is actually more of the pattern that we need yeah, I'm trying to relate this to, to the outside world, I mean, on a larger scale. And even just media in general and the ability to say, I don't know, yeah. is not given much value. Um, everyone has an opinion about everything. It's amazing, even if it's, you know, brain surgery. Mm-hmm. So that work I did with that team around the, the listening to client, one of the key things we talk about is accessing your ignorance which puts you, um, which we have learned, puts you in a vulnerable position to say, I don't know. So there's a lot of conversation around accessing your vulnerability and leaning into it. And I just love that phrase, access your ignorance and trust the questions that come up in your tummy, in your gut when you speak to people and don't second guess yourself on that so much. Our, our problems are too big <laughs> wow, yeah. and too entrenched to not be asking the questions that come up in our tummies. Yeah, that, that what is it, that old, um, if you all you have a ha- is a hammer, then every problem looks like a nail sort of uh, mm-hmm. saying. Mm. Um, but, but so we're moving into intuition really, aren't we? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. To go back to a little bit, so... What do you think it is about your life or your way of living or your upbringing or whatever it is that has <laughs> that took you towards these questions? And, you know, essentially it seems like you're trying to bring heart and intuition into mm. a sort of more rigid brain hand-like arena. Yeah. Um, oh, so many things. I am... Um... I was asked this once in an interview, actually, uh, when I finished my master's. Someone said to me, what happened to you? (laughs) Something happened in your life. I think what happened was place. I have a real, for me, a real belief in the the importance of of, of place and how that can affect your worldview and lens. So I I grew up in Botswana in the the 1980s. I... um, Grew up in a very multicultural environment. Um, I am South African, but I did not have a growing up and upbringing like most South Africans who grew up in South Africa. I grew up in a, in a very different place and space. And I heard something described once, which I just thought captured it perfectly. They said, 
if you're an expat living in an, in an, in a, in an environment, the thing that determines whether you settle in and feel successful in that environment or not is whether you are able to hold two things together at the same time. And those two things are that you have a strong sense of your identity and roots and, and heritage and where you come from. And at the same time, with equal strength, you have a deep appreciation for the place and space and context in which you find yourself. And where I grew up and went to school was just a perfect environment for those two things. That is what I knew growing up. Growing up, And I didn't know, I often say, I don't, I don't know what peer pressure is. I know what it is on paper, but I'd never once felt that I experienced that growing up. And so there's just a deep sense of fairness in me around the value that anybody can bring to a table and that, they, that there just is no one right answer. It, I, just for me personally, my personal ethos is that there just cannot be just one lens on this. There will always be multiple lenses. And I just feel deeply uncomfortable if those varying lenses cannot be shared and aired. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. sorry. That's really interesting. I mean, I grew up in, um, in an international school environment in Geneva, which I tend to, I've had a lot of um, talks about this with different people over the years, but to me, there's almost there was almost a supranational culture in that the people from each country, let's say France, England, wherever, 104 different countries, weren't really from that country either because they, their parents or their family had, had spent a lot of time moving around. So one thing that resonates with what you're talking about is the idea of there being no normal so therefore mm -hmm. no peer pressure. And there was almost a separate culture that was created, which I recognize when I see other people who have moved around a lot. I'd be curious to know more about like your background in terms of that stronger culture you know you have. Where is that one culture, you're, the first one you mentioned, the one yeah. that you are from? Yeah, for me, I would say it's less of a national culture because right. I don't think, I just don't... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> resonate deeply as South African, but there was a there was a sense of just who and what I am, which I think was more shaped by a family environment and what our norms were as a familial group. I think was more the guiding light for me. The second culture was the school culture. Was was that in a different place? Yeah, that the, the second culture. Well, there were many second cultures. Right. Okay. Cool. You know. Yeah. yeah. It, it, <laughs> you know, yeah, <laughs> you went yeah. to an international yeah, school, you yeah. know. But I think predominant, the predominant overshadowing one would be, you know, um, living in Botswana, Botswana people, and the the fabric of of that life. And if you want to be very simplistic about it, you know, at, at home, you, you could say it was maybe more of an individualist kind of. Um, Still very much, oh, I, I laugh now, I live in the UK, I suddenly see all the links back to British and UK culture that I had never noticed right. were in my familial grouping until I moved here. And I thought, oh my goodness, is that where it comes from? That kind of colonial kind of streak. I suddenly see it and think, oh my goodness, that's what it is. But contrast that against a more um, collectivist, <laughs> even the sense of time is different. <laughs> Um, kind of perspective. I'm really grossly simplifying things now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But just realizing that it was not good or bad or right or wrong. There were there was something that existed between that that was more valuable. And quite frankly, and I, I it sounds oversimplifying, but I really believe in this. It that was having a strong role model, which was my dad. Um, whose constant message to his two children was, don't assume that your right is somebody else's right. Yeah. You know, he challenged us on that often. Interesting. So, yeah. yeah. Well, from familial grouping, I would say, than um, a national home culture. Because yeah. it is possible to generalize, but it, you can't take those generalizations seriously in the sense that I look at England from um, a distance. I mean, I live in Italy now, and I've lived here for 12 years. 
and I'm constantly, you know, at the moment I'm doing a fair amount of teaching, so there's constant discussions about the differences between, you know, the English and the Italians, and there are a lot of generalizations, and some of them work, but as soon as you apply them to single people, you mm -hmm. enter, that's when it gets mm -hmm. dangerous. And, yeah. And yeah. essentially that's what, what racism is, isn't it? It's, it's not mm -hmm. seeing the individual and applying a generalization based on whatever. Yeah, it, it's getting lazy and, and, and reverting to a stereotype to explain all things. Yeah. Lazy. And yeah. yeah, and that again, just to provide the link, the kind of work that I do is, is trying to help people become more aware of when they might be doing that and when they need to spend just a little bit more time digging below the surface because otherwise you, you fall into blind spots and traps. Um, and in the environment that I work in, you know, we're trying to find answers to some pretty big questions and challenges and, and really are most people that I'm trying, I'm working with are trying to find, um, solutions for social good. Yeah. You know, to impact on real human beings. And so going in with broad stereotypes um, is not helpful. Great. Well, let's, on that note, let's transition into that, the sort of development or lack of misdevelopment or world changing sort of stuff. There's a few themes that I've been thinking about recently. So I'm just going to shoot them out and then maybe right. they'll become part of our vocabulary for, for going ahead. Maybe not. But one is, uh, a sentence that I heard a gardener saying uh, to, uh, about five years ago, and it's remained and it came up today in a lesson, and it was, until we understand the difference between necessity and convenience, we're screwed, mm. basically. Okay. Convenience is the remote control on the television. Necessity is deal with climate change. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, convenience is... <laughs> you know, a more powerful phone, et cetera, et cetera. And you can look at so many things through that lens. Um, and, of mm -hmm. course, some things are difficult to bridge. I mean, if you're talking about relationships, well, you know, some are convenient, some are ne necessary, or maybe all are necessary. I don't know. So that's one sort of lens. And I just wanted to set mm -hmm. up a few lenses here um, and see what happens. I but, like this, yeah. Yeah. The other one is the definition of left and right in terms of politics. And I heard a podcast, I think it was a Joe Rogan podcast, I think it was with Jordan Peterson. Um, and whether or not people know about Jordan Peterson or like him or dislike him, that's irrelevant. But there was this one um, definition where he was talking about right, right wing obviously being normally connected to the way I normally uh, explained it to my daughter or tried to recently, she's 12 years old, was you know, the father, the traditional father role, the traditional mother role, but it, it seemed to be lacking something. And his, his definition or his explanation I really liked, which was the right being concerned with hierarchy. So mm -hmm. very rigid hierarchy where if you're good at something, then you go to the top and you deserve to be there. And if someone's not, that's their problem. So whether it's when it comes to dating or getting a job or playing football, whatever it is, there's a sort of a sense of skill, limited resources, you fight for everything and that creates competition, mm -hmm. efficiency, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So that meritocracy kind of Total idea. meritocracy. Meritocracy. Yeah. And then on the other side, the left is a sort of a flat. So the right is vertical, if you like, and the left is flat, where all of those people that, you know, have a, uh, you know, lose the birth lottery and have a, don't have the right passport or that, you know, are born uh, with a less IQ than others or uh, they less physical coordination or whatever it is or less emotional intelligence, whatever it is, they end up sifting down and needing help for whatever reason, yeah. need help. And the left is all about finding a lowest common denominator or a common denominator um. and leveling the playing field. And then, uh, which in some ways sounds caring, but it, but can obviously lead to great inefficiencies and, mm. and a tendency to pull down people who are trying to do more and who don't just want to sort of stay uh, put. They want to be ambitious and find, in a good way, you know, and mm -hmm. find mm -hmm. solutions to things and move up and explore and they're curious. And, and um, I thought that was an interesting sort of way of, of, of redefining left and right, which tended to be a little bit two-dimensional for me, but now it's become at least sort of almost three-dimensional. 
I'm mm -hmm. sorry, one dimensional and three dimensional. So the last one I'm going to throw out there is culture as a collection of carrots and sticks over the long term. So for instance, I'm listening to a podcast now about um, the Japanese uh, ending the, in the end of the Second World War that they were finding in the 60s and even the 70s, they'd find individuals still fighting because they'd be in the forest, you know, rainforests of, of, um, yes. of, of uh, yeah, Philippines. You've heard about that. I've heard right? this, yeah. yeah. So what is it that makes them that be the right decision for them, their right decision? And it's about duty and, you know, failure not being an option, essentially, and death being better than failure somehow because mm -hmm. of that extreme levels of duty. And, and that's been set up through carrots and sticks over time. And I just thought that was a really interesting way to... To look at culture, because if you look at Italy, this is a bit of a, uh, it's a long thing by me at the moment, but, but Italy and Norway, for instance, what's the main difference there? Well, Italy tends to be a culture, uh, an honor culture, whether, whereas Norway tends to be an institution culture. And the reasons are perhaps uh, environmental. I don't know if you've read Guns, Germs and Steel, where yes, it looks, I have, yeah, yeah, just to fill in others that might not have, that idea that if you can grow tomatoes for nine months of the year your family unit is going to be your social unit mm. you don't need to collaborate with others whereas if you have long hard winter like you know like the swiss mountains or norway or something then villages need to come together and someone needs to mm. salt the meat and someone needs to do that and so the mm. social institutions are strengthened and there's more social trust so those three just <laughs> those three ideas are something that i feel like i need to look at the world through those and decide what best fits my projects and, and, and mm -hmm. my, my direction and test them out. So I guess my one question could be any comments on that or any thoughts? That, mm -hmm. I've said a lot. You have. <laughs> so if I start with the difference between necessity and convenience, I think that's how you described yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. And I think that, that your person said, until we can recognize the difference between them, we're screwed. <laughs> yeah, he actually said the F word, but I, I was keeping this. <laughs> and I, so I assume that what you, your kind of conversation with him was saying was, if we're focusing on purely convenience, we're never actually tackling things that are, are going to help our, our, our physical survival, literally. But there is some, you know, there's such a... I don't know about in your world, but in my world, there's such a theme at the moment around things being user driven and start with the user need and the human need. And so if someone's saying, well, I don't want to have to get up off the couch for my remote control, then shouldn't we be doing that? Because we want to make things easy for people to use. So when I hear you talk about the difference between necessity and convenience, I can't help but think of, and these are not my terms, um, but the, the work of Otto Sharma, who talks about moving from being egocentric to egocentric, ecocentric, sorry, from yeah. egocentric to ecocentric. And one of the ways that I often think about it is how can we move from thinking about what's good for one particular, quite narrow group of people in a particular setting. So if we think about the remote control and who would be using a remote control and who's got money to pay for those sorts of things and drive that kind of industry, to rather saying what is the greater need for the greater system that is actually beyond a human need and actually also takes into account the wider environmental necessities and and needs out there and you know he talks about working with, with generative listening okay generative listening what, what what would that be yeah so that's tapping into it's quite difficult to explain without pictures but it's tapping into that greater thing out there that wants to and needs to happen that is bigger than you and it is bigger than me, and it is bigger than a purely human-centered need. Um, so I'm trying to think of a good example. I don't know if you've ever, have you ever been in, in like a state of flow? Yeah. Where something's just kind of, so it's, a, it, it's almost getting yourself into a state of flow 
where ideas and need, it's moving almost through you as an individual rather than being something that is that is just a, a fact of need that you have in your head. And so if you are thinking about solutions for necessity rather than convenience, your process to go about those two things would be quite different. If you were going to investigate solutions for convenience, you would probably investigate the needs or challenges of the usual suspects, a particular targeted segment or group. Your reason for investigating those needs might be driven by a particular commercial interest, probably driven by what you and I and most people know as the mainstream kind of economic model, probably for sales (laughs) of some description, to satisfy quite a small stakeholder, probably shareholder need group, and probably to to generate, you know, sale and, and value share price or something like that. Yeah. Whereas if we were going out to investigate something for necessity, we would think very carefully and very broadly about making sure that we go out and investigate need of the bigger ecosystem. So, for example, I know um, of an exercise that was carried out in Namibia. Um, The Namibian government was interested in reducing maternal deaths, you know, women dying in, in childbirth. And typically, the approach would be to investigate quite a narrow subset there, get, gather the data and, and kind of figure out what might be an improvement. What they did instead was they actually went on a deep dive experience of the entire ecosystem, even what we call not the, not the usual suspects. For example, shadowing the um, taxi drivers who often ended up um, ferrying women to hospital for example, you know, just not something you would typically go and do a day in life of study, you know, mm. but through doing this really broad exploration and really coming back and sharing insights and kind of being in that state of paying attention that I described in that previous example of just being open to what was being shared and not having any preconceived ideas around it, they discovered some 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 very new insights around what would go into providing a better experience, not just for those for those mothers, but also for all the people involved in that healthcare system. Because some of the things that they realized were that if the nurses in that system and midwives were not paid enough money or happy in their jobs, or that a taxi driver didn't recognize that he was playing a role in bringing a life into this world, that they probably weren't going to actually make, make much systemic difference. Um, so I feel like my example's gone slightly off track between the remote control and, and great environmental thinking. But often if, if you go on a different kind of journey, you are better able to identify what the root cause problems are. And you are more likely to end up at necessity based answers, things that answer necessity based questions rather than purely convenience based um, answers for a very small segment of people. You're more likely to, to reach a wider group of interests if you take the necessity process than the convenience process. That makes a lot of sense. A couple of things come to mind. We tend to try and solve the light that indicates we're running out of petrol rather than the petrol, mm. you know, the lack of petrol. It's the whole yeah, the symptom, symptoms, symptoms and, yeah, symptoms yeah. and causes. So what you're saying is that by entering into the the way things work, the system, if you like, that's at play in Namibia, they were able to find other aspects of the way of life that could actually make a more meaningful change, more meaningful solutions than just going in and trying to work on the symptom level. Yeah, yeah, that that typical kind of management consultancy approach. And I'm not, you know, doing there's some brilliant management consultancies out there but what we have come to associate with doing using using a generalization now, but the generalization that most people tend to sort of associate it with is very data head. I don't know if you read Dan Pink's left brain, right brain, but a very left yeah. brain approach. Yeah. And it, that might do a convenience number on you, but it's not necessarily really going to push through into the kinds of things that are more right 
not not purely right brain, but bringing the right brain more equally as a partner into the process um, will allow you to tap into. So and we, it's just something that happens, sorry, at a generative level. Sorry to interrupt no, no, you. No, 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 it's very difficult to explain to someone that, that it, 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 there is, it's almost like the answer that sits between us all that we can't see unless we collectively allow ourselves to, to, to pay deep attention beyond, and if I, if you could see me now, you'd see me kind of indicating from the chin upwards beyond just what our head is telling us. Yeah, I mean, this speaks loud and clear to me in that um, my girlfriend is a teacher at a Steiner school and my daughter mm. goes to one and there's a, a, a big distinction between the head, the heart and the hands in terms of the mm -hmm. hands being willpower and, and doing and the heart being emotion and the, mm. the, sort of the moral, the right thing and then the head being, you know, sort of directing and, and, and calculating. Mm. So it, it does make a lot of sense, but it feels like what we're all asking is that why can't society care for each other mm. um, or, or <laughs> set up incentives that work for everyone and create tides that, that do lift everyone, create cultures that do have a, an exponentially or, or at least a virtuous circles built into them and not vicious circles. Yeah. And it sounds like that's something that, you know, you've talked about your work with companies, but it also sounds like you have more to say about that in terms of even if it's just theory you or if it's, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. wh where are we at with that? I mean, maybe we could, we could fill in theory you briefly and then talk about where yeah. we're at as a society. So it's so interesting. Uh, it, Otto, Otto Sharma, who, who's not the only person, but the name is most often associated with theory you, he went to a Steiner school right. and he grew up in a biodynamic farm. Yeah, I saw today actually that he yeah, that which he, is, he borrowed makes a lot from, yeah, yeah. 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 So I think the answer is that, firstly, I think there are pockets where change can happen. So there's something very interesting going on um, in Scotland at the moment, mm -hmm. where a chap by the name of um, Kenneth Hogg um, stumbled across Theory U, and I'll, I'll speak about it in a second, but it's just an example that came to mind because we often talk doom and gloom, and I think it's it's nice to talk about some, some nice examples. So Kenneth Hogg works for the Scottish government. He was in a particular role at the time. I think he's changed role since. And he was tasked very strongly in the role that he was holding to reach out to people as never before, as, 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 as the government had never been seen to do before. And, and he didn't know where to begin. And he stumbled across Theory U and um, the principals and got in contact with Otto Sharma and said, please help me. And... I'll speak about the principles in the moment, but essentially through following those principles and, and enacting them, he ended up drawing in probably about 800 active participants from all walks and shades of life throughout Scotland, certainly not the usual suspects, to come together through various interactions and means and methods to really ask some very deep fundamental questions about what is broken in our society and, and what change do you not want to see but be a part of. And I think there's a very big call to action in this, which is I hear a lot of, you know, when will they change? When will the system change? We are the system. And so one of the things that Theory U talks about is you can't um, – work at a system level without also paying deep attention to your own processing and self in that and constantly needing to move between those two things. In the world that I work in, you know, organizational development consultants often want to say, oh, I work at the system level. I don't work at the individual level. And theory you, for me, one of the calls to action is you have to do both at the same time. So if we are individuals who are, you know, we're off grid, we're trying, we're an independent, we're, we're trying to do something different. I think there's a big call to those people, a kind of provocation to say, are you taking care of your 
the inner place from which you operate in which you do that, because the temptation can still be, even in being independent, you might have accidentally learned how to be independent in a way that matches the system as we still know it. Mm. So you might still unintentionally be propping up something that you actually want to see change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is very interesting to me. So theory you in a bottle, and I'm no Otto Sharma, um, and I, I, I don't work for the Presencing Institute, so I direct anyone to their website to have a look at the executive summaries. But the way I've learned to, to describe it is a way to move from ideas to action, often collectively, but also you can apply the principles to yourself as someone who's trying to be a catalyst for something different that allows for deep transformational shift, frame-breaking shift. So one of Kenneth Hogg's learnings with this um, work that he did with the Scottish government was he said, this is not just to get an incremental tweaky improvement for something. This is a journey you go on and, and these are tools and techniques that we use if, if you are serious about shift. And he said his biggest learning in all of this is how much inner work he has had to do to be um, an effective agent in that, which um, was very interesting for me. And so it describes, Theory U describes a, a paradigm, if you like, a worldview at quite a high principles level. But what it also does is then translates that into practical um, tools and activities that you can grab hold of and, and do something with. And typically the things it focuses on are what are we doing to close the disconnects within ourselves as an individual? They talk about the spiritual divide. How are we reconnecting each of us in ourselves, our own head, heart, hand? Yeah. How are we paying attention to the social divide? So how are we reaching out to people and groupings that may not have fallen within our usual suspects? And how are we paying attention to that? And then the third part, and this is what just sold it for me and got me into this, was how are we um, connecting with the environmental divides? How are we reconnecting in with things like the real economy? Not, you know, the, the, the stock exchange, but the real things, the necessities. Yeah. You know, air, water, a thriving ecosystem that can sustain life on planet Earth, how we are paying attention. So it's it's constantly you've got to move between those three things and take care in your practice and connecting to those three things whenever you're trying to move from ideas to action on something. And then it's also saying, how are you consciously moving between levels of paying attention? So how are you moving to just um, what what is called um, downloading? which is just seeing things purely through your very habitual lens that we all naturally, completely, humanly, subconsciously fall into. And how are you taking care to move to that? In, not always, you can't live in it constantly, but at times allowing for that deep generative paying attention, whether you're doing it as an individual or whether you're doing it collectively as a group. And the key things that you're constantly doing as you do that is you are taking care to notice and shed your judgments, your cynicisms, and your fears. And actually, fear is the deepest one, because fear is that thing that we need to overcome. In generative listening, one of the, the key, key things that you're doing is you're figuring out what of your self-concept you need to let go of, <laughs> mm. which is going to be very painful and scary, sure. and what do you need to pick up. Because in the generative field, you are allowing yourself to be changed at quite a deep level. And I think that's something that we often, we use words like, oh, collaboration, come together in a community. Um, surely, you know, why is that so hard? It's a utopia. It sounds nice. Why can't we all just do it? But very few people are prepared to acknowledge um, the fear that that can bring with it. And I work with a lot of people in multi-dis environments and I work with a lot of people who are using the words collaboration. And the trickiest part of it all is the very deep shift that even, and I, I don't like using the word hippies because I think, again, that's putting people in a box, but let's use the words hippies. Um, 
even they are having to rethink who and what they are in some of these situations, because the typical us them groupings that we have come to like and know and love are not actually helpful always um, and collectively. And that's why I think your question was, why is it so hard? Why don't we see these shifts happening? It's because we don't have enough holding capacity in place to deal with, I think, the fear. Yeah, I, that's, uh, wow, a lot of things. I mean... Uh, <laughs> Sorry. No, 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 it's absolutely... <laughs> Into the pond. <laughs> exactly what, what I love. So that there's the fear and, you know, the, on a personal level and ego and all that kind of stuff. I'm going to put that aside. Yeah. To try and stay on, I guess, these paradigms or these stories that we tell ourselves. And mm. recently I've been learning a little bit about trees and how they communicate and the fact mm. that they will, some trees will give nutrients to other trees when they need it in drought, for instance. And um, so there's a lot of col real collaboration, real giving going on mm. within forests. And it seems to me like we've created, you know, in the last 200 years, 100 years, uh, the idea of survival of the fittest and Darwinian, uh, yeah. Darwinian yeah. sort of explanation to things and evolution, which has been based on this idea, uh, whereas there's actually far more collaboration going on than we know, and we were beginning to explore that more. We're beginning to see, for instance, the tree example or the, our reliance on you know mushrooms, for instance, we don't know about, we know very little about, and mm -hmm. and and it seems like that's a paradigm that needs to sh to change to see ourselves mm -hmm. as almost like cells and the cells to me are, are, are interesting to think. I, I'm not a biologist. I know very little about it, but I know that cells do have to communicate with the outside world, but they have to filter. They can't just let anything okay. into to, yeah. to their eco, their little mini environment. And yet, yeah. and then they work together to be part of a greater organism. Mm -hmm. And that's what we struggle with, I think. And when you talk about fear and the C word, community, the idea of giving up some of these precious individuality and, yeah. uh, you know, agency and sacrificing it for what? For, you know, is, are we talking about all being flattened by communism again or what? <laughs> and, and, and so it does feel like, you know, bringing back this definition of left and right, that there needs to be yes. both, but there also needs to be a sense of ourselves as selves and and to deal with that fear of losing individual agency yeah and uh, it's so funny because the way they describe it in theory you is um breathing in and breathing out you know you kind of go out and say what is the collective you know greater need and good what is the necessity but then you allow yourself to come back in and say but what is what who am i in this you know, they talk about what is my, my work with a capital W work. So you do need to bring things back into yourself. And when you talked about the left and the right earlier, you know, the thing that comes up for me is why does it have to be left or right? Can there be something else? So, you know, Otto Sharma put forward these propositions for change that is needed in society. And he talks about um, we need a new version of um capitalism basically and we need a new version of what economic and, and management thought is for example because that is ultimately at the end of the day you know he, he studied e economics initially as people we do need some kind of way to transact some kind of value it's just it, it's just inevitable and as humans, you know, I think you mentioned it earlier with the left, and, and one of the things that I jotted down for myself was when you were talking about this flat getting flattened is we can't help it. We have a natural human drive to have motivation and purpose. And communism, I think, in its truest form, the difficulty is it takes that away. But then, you know, capitalism in its strongest form is getting too far to that convenience for, you know, too few um, and and is is really siloed and, and disconnected, and so you know the theory you kind of provocation is that it, it, let's build it. It's not a left and it's not a right, which are still these 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 two things that we we just want to swing back to what we know. Is there not something else? 
in the middle of all of it. I often say to people, capitalism is actually working incredibly well for some people. They would never want to change it. It's just, inc you know, it's, it's for the people that are literally making money out of thin air, you know, the Federal Reserve, the private banks and all that kind of stuff, they are making money at the click of a finger and it's, it's working extremely well for them and they're not going to want to change it. But at the same time, everyone else needs to realize that that's their story. It works for them. But we have to create our story where mm. we do decide, well, what is it that we want? If no one believed the story of money, it would cease to exist. It would not be a yeah. useful tool. I mean, it, as it is, it is just a tool. But it, it's a tool that, that facilitates people creaming from the top or mm -hmm. you know, creaming the entire top or whatever it is. But recently I've been watching a few documentaries. One was called Demain, Tomorrow in French. And, and it, mm -hmm. the, it, it goes through a whole bunch of different places. And I don't know if you've seen it, but very much recommended. And one is, is Bristol, where I haven't been to for years. But the mm -hmm. Bristol pound is mm -hmm. one example of 4,000 yeah. local currencies. And that's something that, have you come across that? Have you yeah. uh, interacted with that at all? Well, so funny enough, um, <laughs> Bristol is on my hit list of places to move to <laughs> no, it, <laughs> when I should extricate me, me myself yeah. from London. Funny enough, the Lake District has also just introduced the Lake District um, pound or currency as well. Okay. And so one of the theory you sort of provocations around this is when you move to a, a, a 4.0, they call it this transforming capitalism kind of ecosystem econo economy, that that economy is centered around something that he uses the word bar. Uh, which is uh, it's centered around sense of place. So instead of defining our role in economy as I belong to this company or I belong to the banking sector or oh, wow. I am generating value for, you know, my set of shareholders, yeah. you know, or even I work for an NGO, I work for a for, for purpose, not for profit. It's, you know, kind of not forget about that. But if you collectively, if all those different actors start bringing themselves together around a sense of place and space. I love that because when we say the environment, that's what we mean. We mean the yes. beauty around us. Yes. And so we build those connections between ourselves. And if we take care as, as those we build, so first of all, we build those, those little things. So your cell idea is a, is, a, is a really nice one. If you imagine, um, you can picture these things so beautifully now these days. I don't know if you've ever seen a picture of a social network. Yeah. So instead of thinking about what we're doing, typically we want to present things as organograms or we kind of link the institutions, you know, here's the, the kind of holding institution because they've got the money and then, you know, and they've got the contract and then the next group of people all fit under that. That's a kind of 2D way of looking at it. Just throw that away. And what you'd rather do is you say, okay, where's the challenge, where's the question, and who's related to whom around that question? And so you start building new relational links. And what would happen over time, Otto describes this so beautifully. If you think of what we've all grown up with, which is kind of this you know, classic pyramid idea of how a group of people work. We have the top and then we have this triangle, you know, and it spreads out. We have the leadership and then it comes out to the sort of mass at the bottom. And he talks about change happening from the inside out, almost like a sock unfolding yeah, in on itself. Yeah, yeah. So if we start acting out of sense of place, we start forming connections around place. That sock starts turning itself inside out. And the ideas and the thoughts and the possibilities start coming from the periphery of the system rather than from the center, the institutional center. And that, I think, is partly what you're talking about. And that is why somewhere like Bristol is so exciting, because they do have a core of people there who are just more socially inclined that way. It is known as a core of just energy and, and interest in that direction and it is attracting more people like that and there are interesting things happening and you know Scotland kind of similarly it's no accident that that you know Kenneth Hogg kind of had the place and space to be able to implement and experiment um, with what he's been doing but it takes I'm, and I'm afraid I am going to come back to the courage it, it, it takes some some key keystone species yeah. <laughs> 
in those yeah. systems to have enough um, courage to be able to do that. And I love what Otto Sharma talks about. He says, you know, some in, many institutions that we have these days that we consider to be the paragons and the powerhouses of solutions to the world, they're too small, actually, to solve the massive problems, but too big to solve the small ones. And so we really need to take care to build these relationships between actors. I rather call them actors than organizations because it, for me, it's from the one man band all the way through to the, these massive institutions. They are all actors, but they need to start coming together around, yeah, place and shared challenge. But they don't always recognize that they have that shared challenge. Um, because they don't allow themselves a place and space for that sort of quality thinking and interaction. Man, I love that. It's so simple, but it's such a revelation to just focus on place, to say the word yeah. and to say, you know, when you look outside and you find something beautiful or if you do find yourself in a place with people, it's because you're all appreciating uh, yeah. where you are at that one moment. And, yeah. and it's powerful in the sense that we're hunting and gathering in that place, essentially, anyway. So it's our, yes. it's our home. It's our yes. larger home. And we're connected... We are invested, whether we're consciously aware of it or not, but we are invested in the continuing health of this place. I mean, I, I complain, probably boringly so, about the lack of public space uh, in mm -hmm. this lake where I am at the moment, where it, a lot of it's private, and the, and the public beaches tend to be the places where the private people don't want to be. And it just seems such a shame to take that away, because when people find themselves barbecuing in a public space, and I remember Vancouver and other, other places being good examples there's there's a sense of chilledness where people can uh, mm -hmm. interact and chat and it's the private spaces that that stop that from happening mm -hmm. it's the the yeah. cordoning off and, and the, the barriers that are created wow that's going to be a lot of thought is going to go into that let me just move on though to specifically to community and any comments or experiences or stories you have about setting up communities it's something that I sometimes think of doing I sometimes think of collaborating with some people to buy I don't know two hectares each somewhere that needs reforesting and, and re yeah. you know that kind of thing but but I'm just beginning to research it as a as an idea on the sort of five-year timeline I guess but yeah. is it something you've you've sort of got experience with or <laughs> more observational yeah. I would say um in terms of what you're talking about you know coming together around a particular place to essentially I don't know you know till the land love the land um yeah. I've got observational views on that definitely what I do have a lot of experience in now is bringing together groups of people around I call them virtual, they're almost like virtual communities of interest or practice. So it might be more an idea um, that's not necessarily a physical place. So my observation on the physical place one is it's actually really challenging in practice. Over time, there can be attrition and differences can start to emerge so I've got two things that kind of represent the two ends of the spectrum in my mind. Um, one is, and I'm going to just show I'm a fan now. I don't know if you've ever watched Grand Designs as a show. I have, yeah, a couple of them. Yeah, have. but there was a beautiful one. It's quite an old one where a community came together to build themselves housing. Okay. They called themselves the Hedgehog Collective, I think they called themselves. Um, and it was a group of people who were living on benefits and someone came up with the experimental idea of saying to them, um, if you can commit X number of hours of um, physical activity and, and labor into this, we'll kind of match fund, fund it. And this group of people who didn't know each other came together and they, they built themselves a place. And can, using um, designs actually inspired by Walter Siegel, okay. which I just think... There's so much there that has not even begun to be realized. And they, as a community, they went back and revisited them 20 years later, and they are still all there. And their children have grown up together. Their lives have been transformed. They feel deeply connected to that group of people. And I think that the, the, the factor for me that probably made that work, if I 
contrast it with something else that I'm going to mention in a moment, is that every single one of them had to commit the same level of input mm. to make that thing work. There were no freeloaders or free riders. And this wasn't about, oh, I can pay someone to do it for me. You had to physically turn up and, and participate together over a period of time to reach the final goal. And that final goal was something that was something you were definitely going to be using. <laughs> Um, and people knew, you know, and I think there was something quite clear that they were signing up to and something quite tangible. I contrast that with something else I'm, I'm aware of where a group of people came together, bought a parcel of land with some intentions to kind of have a almost subsistence kind of community around it. And over the years, a, a group of an initial 10 or 12 investors, I think it is, has just kind of whittled down and there's maybe two or three left physically standing and they don't actually have enough manpower to be able to do what needs to be done to make that subsist and work in a model that, that works. It just hasn't taken, taken root. And what I think the difference might be there is people were kind of trying to do that between more than one life. Mm. and so it was this idea of I can live in the city but I kind of think I might be moving to do this but oh, I just kind of can't and then it just becomes easier to just fit back into something where you turn up and you get paid a salary and you you know you carry on because that's a very real draw for people that I think in that situation it was only a, a very tiny number of people who either were completely able to make that shift to a very different way of living and kind of take that risk it was, it was just a step too far. The one I thought of previously, there was, it was a step and a change, but, but, but not what I would in my occupational psychology language call a stretch too far. It was a stretch, but not a stretch too far. This other one, I think for some of the actors in that, it was just a stretch too far. And also, you know, if they didn't turn up or didn't put in the effort, it seemed that there weren't checks to kind of just say, listen, it just seems that this isn't a solution for you. And, and some kind of checks and balances about checking in and, and, and making sure that, that everybody was still on board and being able to have some quite grown up conversations about maybe this isn't for you. It needs to be, a you know, let's, let's rather invite someone else in who might be able to take this up. And perhaps it was just a bit nebulous. You know, it, it, it was an idea and it was a feeling, but just not quite described enough in it. For, for people to really know exactly what they were signing up for. Which I, I say that with a caveat because you can never know exactly what you're signing up for. But again, it was just somehow just a step too far. It was too nebulous. It, it, didn't, have yeah. a, it didn't have a very clear, not even goal or objective, but a, a philosophy or a way or an approach. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I think, you know... It, one of the things that you really need to be able to make that work with a group of people is you need to be able to have some very tough conversations sometimes. And I think quite often there's so much energy and excitement in the beginning and we just so badly don't want to be having to hard conversations or arguing with each other or disagreeing or saying, you know what, actually this just doesn't work for me. That that just sits and then rather the, the actors just drift apart. So there has to be a compelling enough reason for them to to stick together through it. Yeah, I mean, they're often set up around, you know, veganism or some sort of cult or religion or whatever it is. There's, there's sometimes mm -hmm. a theme, but it I doesn't convince me. I think it, this, these ideas you've mentioned of, of plays, also the fact that the first group you mentioned didn't have as much to lose. Or they, they, were, yeah. they were more in sort of expansion mode rather than yes, that's being good. pruned. Yeah. Um, that's interesting. So I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I want to ask one one more question, which is, mm -hmm. um, that's not true, there's going to be two more questions. But the, the question is, like, is governance. Mm -hmm. There are alphas out there. There are different forms of management, different styles yeah. of management. Some work well for some things, others work well for others. What, what advice would you have to to these communities? I mean, I know you're not in one, you haven't got experience, but mm -hmm. if, if you want to speak about companies, for example, or, or when you see groups of friendships or yeah. 
How does that play out for you? Yeah. So people often want to be quite binary and say, you just need to get the governance right. And then other people say, oh, we don't, we don't like, you know, we don't like rules and we don't like processes and we don't want governance. You know, we just, we just need to trust each other and get along. You know, it's like it has to be one or the other. And, and the lesson, I, I say this with absolute conviction, is you need both. Um, so we often talk about getting the um, um, kind of the legal relationship right, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. the, the kind of on paper um, and governance is part of that relationship, right? But coupling that with a high relational strength as well. And you put those two things together and, and then you have kind of, then you've got it nailed. So in terms of governance, a couple of ideas to throw out there um, and inspirations to have a look at. There's something called TEAL, T-E-A-L, uh-huh. that is quite interesting. And a chap called um, Frederick Lalou and, and Reinventing Organizations is a, is a book he wrote. Now, that is a real extreme end um, of suggestions around a, a radically different governance structure. When those, when those have been put into practice in real life, th- th- we're starting to get the feedback now. Um, there's a company called Zappos um, that just said, we're doing this, we're going for it. And the reason these things fail is people don't commit enough, so we're doing it no matter how painful it is. Right. And some learnings are starting to emerge from that that you can have a look at. But what it just comes back to me full circle every time is you can find models out there, pick one that you think will work for you, and realize at the same time that the need to nurture your relational strength within that government governance mechanism, the responsibility to nurture that relational strength is never going to end. You are never going to have to stop taking care of the relationships that that governance structure helps to direct or referee or channel the biggest mistake that I think people make is just think that that governance structure, whatever it is that you choose is going to fix it. And what I've seen in my work is there are groups of people who are able to come together and collaborate no matter the governance structure, because they care enough about whatever it is that they say, I don't care that governance structure doesn't work for us. We're just going to find a way to work around the edges. And it's because they've developed a good relational strength. Now, long term, I don't think they would be able to sustain that without turning around and saying, we need to change this governance structure to fit what we have created here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But that just is a lesson for me that in the short term, with enough relational strength, you can overcome any governance structure. But in the long term, you need to get that governance structure to match. On the other hand, I've seen people go and spend a lot of time and attention just thinking, if only I get the governance structure right, and then it still falls apart. And it's because they haven't looked to that relational bit or they've taken care of it, taken care of it in the beginning, but haven't over the long term realized that you're constantly going to have tough conversations within that. Um, so I feel like I'm not giving you a very exact answer. No, that works totally for me. I think, but, I think yeah, it, makes, it, it makes sense with what I've seen as well. Yeah. So really, I, I have my lens and I, I'm talking from my, my downloading space. But if my one message would be is pay attention to the, the container that you create for human relationships. And that takes practice. That's a perfect place to just ask you my last questions, which are any resources, any books you'd recommend, things that have given you disproportionate benefit, um, yeah. having known them, anything that comes to mind? Yeah. So something that really profoundly affected me and I think is just can speak to anybody of any walk of life if you are feeling that there must be another way and a better way is um, a book called Presencing. Okay. And that was written by Otto Sharma together with um, a lady called Betty Sue Flowers, I think her name was, and a third author, someone Jaworski, I can't remember his first name. And that is just an, a brilliantly written, very digestible book He later developed things further that have become a lot more um, directed to businesses. But if you start off with presencing, I think that's a really good start. 
I've mentioned just for fun, you know, if people want to investigate Teal and Lalu, it really is an extreme end of things, but just really good to shake things up and think, oh my goodness, you know, that's something completely different and just really turn yourself um, on your head. Just trying to think what else. I, I, I don't like overloading people, but I think those are interesting places to start. Sounds great. Sounds great. I feel like we could talk for, for hours and... and uh... <laughs> Um, next time I'm in London, I'll definitely um, invite you for coffee to say thank you for a wonderful, wonderful conversation. Is there anything you would, you're sort of looking for at the moment or need from anyone? Do you, any sort of, I don't know, um, requests or asks or anything else just before we sign out? My asks to the universe. I, you know, I got into what I'm doing and, and the work I'm doing at the moment because ultimately I would just love to see more true collaborations between the more independently minded, off-grid directed thinking and approach with, you know, some of what are often considered the big bad institutions. You know, I work for a very, I work for a conventional engineering business and I would just, I would love to have the opportunity to play more of a role in bringing those together and recognizing what is the possibility and the crack of opportunity that exists between them. So any things like that out in the world that are happening and, and, and think they might need a container, I'm your gal. Wow, I like and it. That's well, about it, really. <laughs> oh, yeah, I wish that was, I wish that was, um, I'm sure... I'm sure a guy would, would be, just as I would, would love to, to be in that position and, and it will surely happen at some point. Someday, somehow, yeah. I, you know, trust in it is all I can do. Cool. Well, listen, um, thank you so much, Liz. And, uh, yeah, take, take care and, and uh, I hope that we, we meet again soon. Okay. Thanks very much, Patrick. Thank you. Cheers. Well, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Before you go, or rather immediately after you've gone, please go down to iTunes, leave a review, help us grow, get more guests, raise more money for projects. We have other projects coming up. You can find news about those on offgrid.vision, where you can also get access to other shows and some phenomenal t-shirts which go towards, well, the profit of which goes towards new projects. If you have any requests for someone to come on the show, do let me know via the site. Until next time, thanks for listening, and see you soon. Bye.